Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the first, fourth installment of Viral, Synetics uh, Virtual Roundtable. Um, we uh, started these in an effort to um, bind the, a, a sort of isolated entertainment community, uh, entertain a little bit, and maybe impart a little knowledge uh, along the way. Um, so there you go. Uh, a couple, a little bit of uh, housekeeping before we get started. Um, hold, th save your questions because we're gonna have a part of the conversation where we take you, the viewing audience's questions. Uh, there's also a chat bar, which I think is missing from mine, Sarah. If you can add like, so I can see who's on and who's chatting. Um, uh, I, that's not at the bottom of the screen. And um, what else? Uh, there's, it's been, uh, we've, grown, we've grown our viewership every successive uh, virtual round table, but our live uh, uh, participation has gone down, I think because people realize they can time shift it and watch it on YouTube. So in an effort to get people to tune in live because that's more of an interactive experience, I think we're going to raffle off a million dollars or something like that uh, live, maybe in the next one. Um, or I was talking about, there we go. I was talking about having Blair, you know, she was wanted to volunteer to production manage a, a movie for free, but then, you know, she thought better of that. Very um, or Steve will bond a movie for free. For free. Uh, so anyway, um, we're about to get started, but in, in the true cat skills tradition where at least Blair and I are, uh, I'm gonna start with a joke. So a man walks into the library and goes up to the desk and says, I'd like a ham and cheese sandwich with lettuce, tomato, and mustard. The librarian says, sir, this is a library. He says, sorry, I'd like a ham and cheese sandwich with mustard, tomato. <laughs> Thank you, Blair. That's my exit line. Goodbye, everybody. So bad. <laughs> <laughs> that was that came to me courtesy of Jeff Rose, and I have to credit him. Otherwise, it's plagiarism. Uh, although he plagiarized it from somebody else. Um, so tonight's discussion uh, is about restarting and risk. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about the protocols um, that are going to surround physical production restarting. There's been very little conversation about uh, uh, making sure that any, if, should anything untoward happen and production has to stop, will there be uh, insurance coverage? Uh, and will there be completion bonds in, uh, while the risk of pandemic still uh, continues? And that is going to be a focus of what we're talking about our panel tonight. Uh, we have a really, uh, star-studded group. Um, we have Steve Ransoff, who's the CEO of Film Finances, uh, the premier completion guarantor. Uh, where are you coming in from tonight, Steve? I'm coming from Idaho, yes, where I've are. been holed up for the last three months. Um, uh, and um, we have Blair Briard, who is somewhere in the Catskills. Blair uh, is a super high-end producer and production manager, and also a prime mover in the Producer COVID Response Alliance, which uh, was instrumental in creating um, the protocol. So we're gonna talk about it in a minute. Uh, Blair, uh, where are you coming from? I'm in a, uh, a sort of very raw space, um, reclaimed, abandoned building that is now an art center in the tiny village of Prattsville, New York in Greene County. Right on. Because it's the only place we can get internet here. So here I am. And last but not least, uh, coming from, I can imagine he's coming from the nation's capital uh, because he is the chief of staff of Congresswoman Carolyn Carol Maloney, um, who has been a prime mover in the insurance relief uh, legislation that is going through Congress. This is Andrew Lowenthal. Andrew, hey, everybody. Good evening. Um, there you go. So uh, as is our tradition, before we get into the meat of the matter, 
I'm going to go to each of you and ask you to sort of give us a minute on uh, on your professional, personal background, anything that, that sort of got you to where you are today. And Andrew, since you're in the only business as, basically as disreputable as our business, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm interested to know how you got there. Sure. Uh, let's see. Um, well, I have I have the traditional Washington resume of staying one step ahead of my performance evaluation. So I got to D.C. after college, worked for the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee in 88 for John Kerry. Uh, after that, I came up to New York and became actually then Councilwoman Carolyn Maloney's uh, chief of staff in the New York City Council. Um, when she represented East Harlem in the South Bronx, um, was her council, was her chief through redistricting and her first run for election to Congress in 92 when she beat a 14 term Republican incumbent, stayed with her through and successful uh, reelection campaign in the 94, the Gingrich uh, wave. And then I went to work for Chris Dodd on the Senate Banking Committee. I was Evan Bayh's first legislative director. I was chief of staff at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. In the last two years of the Clinton administration, I ran uh, Senate Democratic Relations for Freddie Mac, uh, started a firm downtown that uh, represented a variety of financial services entities, uh, all of whom um, were non-TARP recipients post-crisis. Um, in 2009, on President Obama's inauguration day, my beautiful African-American wife, mother of three, passed away suddenly. Uh, and kind of managed that um, for a number of years. And in 2015, decided to take a break from my eldest son's uh, last year home as a, as a senior in high school. I discovered that kids do come home in college, but it's very different. You don't, they're not your kids anymore. They're just angry tenants. And, um, but took some time with that and decided I didn't want to lobby anymore. Didn't like the direction of that and became a writer for a company called Reorg, which is a uh, super fast growing media competitor to Bloomberg. And in uh, about, about 13 months ago, um, had a chance to connect again with the Congresswoman who is one of my great friends and her chief of staff was, was departing and I always had the dream of coming back to Congress. And uh, so May of 2019, and it has been an incredible deeply meaningful, um, historic, unprecedented, terrifying, thrilling moment. Uh, take her uh, through becoming the chairman of the Oversight Committee, which was a lead in the impeachment of Donald Trump, and then to turn around with the New York City member and to help um, both in terms of the immediate needs of New York through the pandemic, um, but also on the national level uh, to work on issues to be informed by what's happening in New York, which I think led to a host of uh, legislation that she is pushing uh, vigorously. Um, and also, of course, you know, most importantly, I think right now, with due respect to this audience, but our, our focus has really turned to the, 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 the desperate cry of our country for um, racial justice, for a curbing of the militarization of the police, uh, to deal with the, the, the horrible festering issues that um, that our current president has, uh, I think, uh, awoken and uh, poured salt into the wounds. And, um, you know, really uh, grateful for the opportunity to be working for her because how we uh, make the economy able to restart and also more resilient for what we now know is gonna be uh, more of these type of pandemics um, that we have to confront is, um, is a thrill for me. So that's my uh, that's my life story in I, I think, I, I 90 seconds. I probably should have told you before we started that most of our viewing audience are conservative Republicans. Um, yeah, well, come at me, baby, come at me. And and I, I believe your boss is probably who we should blame for not getting a conviction in the Senate on impeachment. Um, uh, you have a lot yeah, to answer for, my friend. Uh, that I I would uh, I would say we unified the Democrats, and and she's responsible for convincing Mitt Romney to cross the line so they get a bipartisan vote for conviction. At the end of the day, he is the impeached president of the United States, as our Twitter feed refers to him as hashtag impotus, not POTUS. <laughs> nice, uh, damn man, that is a history and very well. <laughs> Uh, Steve Ransohoff, over to you. Let's. Uh, you you've been involved. You've been at this game about a, as long as I have. So you got a lot to answer for and talk about. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think we first met like in 1987, but anyhow, that's uh, what, 33 years ago. I started out as a lawyer um, working for an entertainment law firm, 1980. Didn't you grow up on sets? Am I imagining that? Uh, well, my father was a film producer, yes. Right, that's what I and, thought. And uh, so I, was, I grew up in the film business. Uh, there's a question here, is Martin Ransahoff? But, but anyhow, um, <laughs> so he was a film producer, a television producer, whatever. Anyhow, I went to law school. I uh, worked at uh, Loeb & Loeb, where I was doing uh, transactional work for entertainment companies, mostly in the finance space. I met uh, the man that ran Film Finances who hired me in 1986, and I went to work there. Film Finances gives completion guarantees, it was the company that really founded um, that business uh, back in 1950 in London. And uh, so I've kind of rose through the ranks. I wound up buying the company in, what was it, 2008 uh, with my partner, a guy named Kurt Woolner. And uh, so we've run the company. I'm still the CEO of the company after all these years. And since I've been at the company, we've done over 5,000 movies. It's about 200 films a year, maybe it's 6,000. So we have a great deal of experience all over the world in film production. And through that, which I'll get into later, um, really about how this whole insurance thing is becoming a real serious problem for people in the future to get their films made in the independent space. For studios, it won't be such a problem because they can self-insure, but for independents, it will be. And that's why someone like Andrew here is uh, very important. So with uh, that, I'll turn is it up to work for me to ask how many of those five thousand films you've had to come in on? Um, Question. Probably two hundred and fifty in various ways. Um, I mean, it's not always putting up money. Some of it is just management. Um, yeah, no, I, I. You know, I, as you know, films always start out with everybody being best friends. And in many cases, they wind up with everybody hating one another. So in many cases, we have to uh, get involved in the management of the film because things become so dysfunctional. Yeah, but it, yeah. I'm laughing. there was an article recently from, that our friend Sky Moore wrote that was incredibly simplistic and completely missed that aspect of what you guys do. Um, and I've seen it, and I've benefited from it, and I agree with you. Well, he's an interesting fellow. And, um, you, you know, it's, it, we, we've played a role in a, in a lot of movies. It's not always about putting up money. Like I said, it's managing things, making sure people avoid problems. But, uh, you know, th that, that's, that's a book and a half. But on this insurance thing, it's, it, as I was saying before this call started, um, you know, there's some real issues that people face, and I'll get into that shortly. Thank you, sir. Uh, Blair Briard, tell us a little about yourself. Well, after um, Andrew's introduction, I thought you must have invited me to the wrong panel because I don't think, I, I mean, that's very impressive what, what you've done. Sounds better on paper than it was to live it. <laughs> well, it's really, that is quite, quite a resume. Um, and Steve as well, I've worked on um, some of your bonded, I've used your company as a bonding uh, company several, several times. So I started in low budget independent film. My first job was as an unpaid intern on John Sayles' film, Passion Fish. A and film that I happen to be an executive producer on. I know it. <laughs> I know it, John. Oh, yeah. We're at the beginning. That's where I had my first boudin. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, Mark Ricker and I slept under sound blankets in abandoned cabins in the woods. So, um, but it was, a, that was an amazing um, first uh, project to work on with a real sort of auteur visionary filmmaker. Thank and then you. Back in, <laughs> um, Back in New York, uh, I worked on a documentary feature and then the sound mixer recommended me to um, a film happening in Vermont and I was the production manager on that and then I just never stopped working. 
um, worked with a lot of, you know, in New York, in the indie world, you know, like we were all, many of us were doing at that time, kind of $2 million, $3 million, $4 million films, all being bonded by film finances. You never had to come in on one of mine. Thank you. And um, then bigger features. And then I kind of went into really sort of auteur driven television and, you know, was a creative producer for the last 10 to 12 years on a bunch of different kind of interesting television series and just did a couple of other features. So now, you know, that's what I'm doing. Um, so features, that's, 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 television. I don't want to give up features ever. I love them both. I love TV and film. So that's a little blithery, well, but that's me. Seems that increasingly, everybody's moving more fluidly, obviously, between episodics and features. Um, so uh, that won't be that difficult, I bet. To I'm format it. fluid. I'm format fluid. So, so I'm going to stick with you, Blair, and we're going to start this by talking about the production protocols. About That's where most of the information has come out, and a lot of work has been done behind the scenes to get all the guilds in alignment and to create a set of rules for restarting production and maximizing safety, I guess I would say. Do you want to talk about that process and anything else you want to say about it before we get to uh, other questions? Sure. So I guess about two weeks uh, after the shutdown, a small group of, of New York producers uh, 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 and, and I, a well, group of us, decided that we should kind of get together and start getting in front of this issue of how we're going to go back to work because it became clear pretty quickly that this wasn't going to go away fast and New York already has a lot of difficulties right P the, people are always looking for reasons to say no to New York it's too expensive there's not enough stage space even though we have really deep crews here there's so much work here that the crews aren't quite deep enough and we just didn't want to we wanted to sort of get in front of that and say actually, uh, and, and then throw in being the center of a pandemic, right? So we wanted to kind of put out a message that was saying, we are veteran New York producers on the ground. If anybody can solve this problem, we can. And we wanted to sort of create a set of safety protocols so we could say to the film and, and television community, we're on it, we're thinking about it, and here's how we think we can solve these problems. So the group expanded, there are about 40 of us in the group now, we're very agnostic, um, and we're all, we cover a range of, of experience. There's some younger people in it who have only been working in New York in the boom years when there's just tons of work all the time, and there are a lot of us who are in the group who, were there for some of the shutdowns or the strikes or when the work was much less uh, plentiful. So we cover big budget television, low budget television, big budget features, low budget features, indies, all across the board. So we started working on a document that were best safety practices really with a unique um, New York lens because New York is a very specific, you can see I'm getting like the sun here. New York has a very specific set of challenges. So we started talking to all the unions, all the guilds, studio executives, other producers, crew members, people that we have relationships with to get input. We uh, have an epidemiologist that we talk to regularly. Um, you know, just the gamut of, of people who could help inform this document, the AMPTP, the MPA, everybody. We really want, and we were the first people, first group in America, really, I think, to come up with a very comprehensive document. We distributed it widely to all our studio friends, unions, guilds, um, AMPTP, MPA, everybody. And then I think in the white paper that came out that went to um, the governors, we were given a special thanks in the back, which was nice. So we're continuing, we talk every week with unions, guilds, crew people, um, insurance, uh, uh, um, the people who are creating tests. Um, we've created a, a document that's a guideline for what the health and safety supervisor should do. 
So we're just trying to be in front of this issue. And, you know, I mean, New York producers are hardworking people and we're often faced with incredibly weird and adverse circumstances, September 11th, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, um, so that's the New York Producers COVID Response Alliance. And we really just wanted to liaise with all the elements, all the people, um, all the groups and say, we're an agnostic group who are just here to help solve the problems that are- so Is there now a synthesized industry-wide protocol for how we are restarting production? So there's the white paper, which came out. Then there on Friday, there was another huge document that came out that the guilds and the unions were um, uh, created together. And it's, it's, it's a 36 page document. It's very, very detailed. And I think right now, everyone is waiting for a response from the studios, from the employers to that document. And it's a roadmap um, and it's, it's a lot. It's a very, very complicated document. The, the DGA, everybody was actually very instrumental in putting together that document. So yes, there, there is not yet an agreed upon set of protocols by everybody. That means studios, unions, and guilds. The unions and guilds have agreed and now they're waiting to hear from uh, the studios, from my understanding. <clears throat> So I think we can all agree that the one growth industry that's going to come out of all of this is the health compliance officer. Huge. Um, how does one train and become uh, a health compliance officer? Is that is there actually a process for doing that? Or is there a background that's going to um, lend people to predis be predisposed? Yeah, I think so. So there's there have been a million conversations about this. And I think the health and safety supervisor is really coming from a medical background. They don't necessarily have to be a doctor, but maybe they're an RN or a medical technician. They have to be a step up from our set medics, right? They can't just be handing out Band-Aids. And they're going to have to go through some kind of COVID safety uh, training program. I saw an ad that Fox uh, put for their Atlanta, for the Atlanta region, and it was really detailed about the kind of person they are looking for to be trained as a health and safety supervisor. So it's a very high level medical professional who gets trained specifically in COVID then we'll have um, a kind of health and safety manager who is more production oriented, who will interface with the health and safety supervisor so that, because that's a kind of person who doesn't know anything about the unique um, rhythms of film production. So it's a big, I think it's a very big addition that we'll have to be bringing on to our sets. Um, but, it can't be this. It became very clear that this is not um, this is not the responsibility of like the production manager or a DGA person or the producers. It's beyond our capabilities to create content and deal with the pandemic. And we're not epidemiologists. So I guess the question this begs is on a on on these medical shows will will the the medical consultant uh, be also be able to double as the health and safety uh, officer? It's a good question. Career opportunity. Yeah. Um, so okay, so we're at the point where we've got best practices evolving for production, um, and that may be great for people like Netflix and the studios who ensure their own productions often against uh, interruption, um, but there are independents. There are, there are 5,000 films that you have bonded, many of them independent. They're, whether they're uh, not financed by the students, whether they're financed by equity. Um, Steve, what, is the, what are the possibilities now that, that these productions that, have, that are using these best practices are going to be able to get the insurance package they need uh, in the unlikely event or likely event that they get shut down uh, to not just be a bottomless pit of, of cost. Well, maybe what I should do is just kind of, uh, I'll answer the question, but in a roundabout way. I mean, for, first of all, people aren't gonna go back to work on anything until A, it's safe to do so, 
and B, that people feel safe about it. So all these safety protocols that people have been developing and you know it's all under discussion now, you know, are critical because obviously no one's going to go back to work. In terms of the insurance side of it, I'll just kind of go through what I was doing before. So while I've been at Film Finances, we've been involved in well, well over 5,000 movies. And these insurance packages that people buy for films, um, there's a number of different coverages that people get. You don't just buy insurance to cover actors getting sick or dying, God forbid. You buy insurance for equipment failing, for equipment being stolen. And the one thing that's happened here is there's something called civil authority. And civil authority covers co uh, losses you have as a result of government edicts. So for example, during the um, Northridge earthquakes, a number of movies that were shooting in LA got shut down because the government said, you can't go to certain places. Uh, during Hurricane Katrina, obviously there were problems. But the point is, is over the 5,000 plus movies we've been involved with, probably only about 75 of those films actually had imminent peril claims over my 30 years at the company. In one day, when, you know, or one week when this pandemic hit, uh, there were over 130 claims just on films that we were involved with. So I think that gives you an idea of the extent of it. And it wasn't just in Los Angeles or Georgia, it was all over the world. So film shooting in Morocco, film shooting in Canada, film shooting in New Zealand, film shooting in Australia, everywhere uh, these people have the same type of claims. So that's what's turned this into a nightmare. And so that's just 130 films that we were involved with um, you know, at Film Finances during a time of year when you know, it's not that busy. Um, and these are claims that because they're, they were part of the existing insurance package, yeah. Will in all likelihood be paid? Yeah, when you get the insurance, it's almost thrown in. People, you know, when we talk to people about it, nobody even knew they had that insurance. It's just something that's like thrown in. It's not <laughs> something you negotiate. It's not like you say to your broker, well, I want more coverage for civil authority. It's like, what the hell is that? And so basically you have thousands of claims coming from television shows, movies, and this is all over the world. And this insurance is sold by insurance companies on the basis, like I said, it's just thrown in. And, you know, insurers had assumed, well, if something terrible happens, if there's a storm in Buffalo and three movies are getting made in Buffalo, we'll cover that. You know, they, they it, totally unprecedented to have every film all over the world suffer the same kind of loss. So these insurers are taking, you know, what will probably be billions of dollars of losses from this. So can I ask a technical, I'm sorry, can I interrupt you and ask a technical question? Sure. Um, civil authority insurance is different from act of God insurance. Like if there was a hurricane, but the authority didn't tell you to stop production as a result of it, could you collect on that insurance? Well, you would you would collect because your set was blown down or- Because acts you, of God are covered. You, you yeah. Have, yeah, that would be like physical damage. The civil yeah. authority claim is because people can't go to work, right. right? You just have to shut down because you can't go to work. Uh, what you hear about on the news is stuff called business interruption insurance. It's the same concept is you can't go to work because the government says you can't go to work. And there's another coverage called imminent peril, which is basically if you see a tornado coming, everybody runs away from the set, people can't work that day, that would be like imminent peril. So there's these different kind of very um, almost obscure type insurance coverages that insurers had sold because it was something that was um, just part of the package. And they've been hurt very badly by this because it not only has happened on every movie, but every movie around the world. I mean, we, we were involved in films on every continent. And- So those, so those are the movies that were bound happened. and interrupted. What, what, so what happens now going forward when everybody has these protocols 
and they feel safe and they're ready to get back to work, are they going to be able to get production and insurance package? Well, you can get insurance coverage, but none of these insurers will cover um, what they're calling pandemic risk. Right. So in other words, if COVID comes back in the future, that won't be covered. If there is a new COVID, that won't be covered. If, you're, so, if your lead actor gets sick from this COVID while you've gone back, will that be covered? No. If you're starting production now and just finding insurance. No, you can't, you, you can't find that insurance because basically the, every insurance company buys reinsurance. Reinsurance is bought from these gigantic companies called like Munich Re, General Re, Swiss Re. They, they all have the word re in it, which is a shorthand for reinsurance. And these, these reinsurance companies won't cover a pandemic risk because it's something that you can't figure out. Like if you're an insurance company and sell car insurance in Philadelphia, you kind of know how many cars are gonna get in accidents during a year if nothing terrible happens. With this pandemic thing, insurance companies have no way of knowing what the harm is gonna be because they don't know what the disease is gonna be. They don't know who will be affected by it. So what they've decided to do is say, well, we're just not gonna cover it. But and Steve, what about the government, not to ju just jump in and interrupt you, but what about, I, is it true that in the UK and maybe in Canada, the government is setting up a kind of an insurance fund for productions because if right now it seems to be one of the one of the bottlenecks of getting back to work is this issue of insurance and liability right so yes. you know there's a big dga call today and it's just you know if if anybody asks you to sign a waiver of liability in case you get sick you can't do that but if they're the insurers you, aren't going to cover you, that, right? what, how, what, where is the, how do we solve that problem? All right, can, can I, uh, th that is a perfect segue. That's why over, Andrew is here. Yeah, we're over to Andrew Lowenthal. Okay. Raison d'etre on this panel. Yeah. Uh, and that is a piece of legislation that, that is in somewhere in Congress that obviously hasn't been passed that you're a prime yeah. mover on called, uh, the anagram P or acronym PREA. Do you want to you want to talk about it? So yeah. So let me just set this up, Andrew. If, sure. if what Steve is saying is that if if all these protocols are being observed, that may be fine for someone like Netflix who is willing to assume the risk of having to shut down. But the people, uh, many of us in the independent world, who can't assume that risk and need to know that there there's insurance in case someone gets sick on set despite all these protocols. Uh, and there can't be insurance, it sounds to me like you cannot start production without some form of government intervention, which is what Blair is talking about. Enter PREA, which is, I believe, created to address this issue. Do you wanna, do you wanna sure. talk about this? And, and uh, th thank you. I mean, I think you, that's, exactly, that's exactly right. And, and, and the perception is, I mean, and I think the, the, the reason for that is, 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 is not only recognizing that um, company, we need, we need some sort of insurance backstop in order to restart and have the economy moving in full and not just being dependent on the largest ent enterprises and those with the capacity to take on liability um, but also to make the economy ultimately more resilient. I think it would be foolish uh, to uh, have gone through this, and, 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 and you can argue how foolish America is on a number of things, but it'd be foolish to have gone through this and not expect that it's going to happen again. And globalization, the nature of mutations, the speed with which they, they, they spread, you know, we've gone through it once and, and it's, it's very rare that anything is a one-off. So in terms of just how our economy is more resilient in the future against these kinds of shocks, uh, Priya is part of it. I think I just want to step back and it's, it, it, it's going to be weird for me because I'm actually going to argue an insurance company point of view, even though they're very opposed to Priya and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. But the idea of, but, 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 but the, the, the problem insurance companies face is inherently in the nature of what insurance is, which is insurance is predicated on the idea that you're paying into premiums 
on the assumption that the insurance company will not have to pay everybody out at once. There simply is a not enough money in insurance company reserves and premiums to expect that they could pay everybody at once. So a life insurance company doesn't exist, God forbid, if everyone is dead at the same time. Um, and the same is true with the property and casualty industry, who is the insurers of businesses and business interruption. Um, you know, some of the companies are your auto insurers, but some of them are more specialized. But I've seen one statistic which said, you know, basically the entire U.S. In property and casualty industry has about $800 billion in reserves and assets available. And the cost, if you were to pay every claim as a result of the pandemic and, and what has happened here is a trillion dollars a month. So that even if the insurance companies wanted to pay everything, if they were willing to, and believe me, they're not, um, they, they, the money isn't there to cover all of it. There aren't sufficient premiums. And therefore, there is an important role for the government to play. I think one of the things that Priya envisions, though, is that there still is a role for the insurance company to pay, and there's still some liability that insurers can bear. Uh, I think the Academy of Actuaries actually does think that pandemic is something that's scalable and modelable, and a premium can be assessed by it if you have the government acting as the reinsurer of last resort. And that's really what Priya says. Priya yeah. says, insurance company, you pay, you, you offer the policy, you pay in a small percent of your collected premiums to the government, so 5% of what you collect. And at the end of the day, the government will, up to a certain amount, pay 95% of those claims. I think, uh, I, I think the, the, the limit we set was around 250 or $500 billion. And, and that is the idea of to restart. It's a voluntary program. But if you start the market, we believe that there will be enormous demand for it. Insurers will actually compete and be aggressive in wanting to offer this product in order to be the one that gets the most business type uh, um, business clients and to take away from those companies that are unwilling, that are unwilling to do it. The insurance companies have an idea that it's all taxpayer paid. And that's the difference, I think, with the Canadian and some of the other models. And right. that is, I don't think it's reasonable to say that the American taxpayers are going to create a fund to pay everybody. Also, Priya is not limited to any one industry. It, there are so many from retail to independent film and television, to sporting venues, to the small leagues, to the big leagues, uh, all of whom want to have this kind of insurance as, as, as a way of um, you know, basically being able to reopen with confidence, but also to know that if this happens again, they don't have to necessarily wait for the government to come and bail them out, that there is at least some mechanism that's known to everybody, that's a process that's pretty easy to follow, that can get money flowing right away. So what, so what is the possibility that this will actually become law because it may be needed to restart independent production? I, I think that, that we are, you know, I, I don't want to put a, I don't want to put a specific date, but I think that we believe, you know, the Congresswoman believes and, and, and the industry trades that we're working with and, and our co-sponsors you know, I, that, that this is something that we could see done by the end of the year and enacted into law. There is a difficulty with what the administration's view is and with some of the Senate Republicans who have generally been listening to the insurers who would prefer not to deal with this at all. And I, I don't mean to castigate the industry because obviously if I was sitting in their shoes, I wouldn't want to pay either for something that I don't feel like I have liability for. At the same time, insurers have an enormous amount of risk at the state level where a number of state legislatures are driving to try and make the claims for this pandemic. And our legislation is prospective, but they're trying to make the claims for this pandemic retroactively available for people to file and to go forward. And I think that's a huge risk for the industry and for them to be in a position where they can't offer any solution. And again, I would say an insurance company, it's, it, it's, it's funny, we don't ever go back to like basic roots, but they are chartered, literally chartered. They have a charter from a state uh, that says that they are there to provide some sort of service for which the state is giving them the right to operate. And if that's the case, that means that they have an obligation to our society as a whole and to provide insurance that lets the economy function. 
So Steve, is it fair to say that without this government backstop, it will not be possible for independent production to restart in earnest uh, while the pandemic uh, is still at ri a risk? Well, it will be difficult, but I mean, there, there are various people, I speak to people in the insurance industry every week, uh, sometimes every day. Um, there are some insurers who are actually looking into providing some kind of uh, limited coverage for COVID. Um, and, but yes, to get back to where we were before, it will require some sort of uh, government backstop. Uh, th there's some questions I can see in the chat about uh, these state programs. Um, there are programs being done in um, France, Canada, they're being talked about in, in the UK, but these are very small, limited amounts of money, pools of money. They're talking about 50, $100 million. That's not really going to work for the United States. It's going to have to be in the billions, but it can be something that, and here's an insurance word that can be underwritten um, in terms of, you know, an insurance company saying we'll provide insurance, provided protocols are done, provided their health checks, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, so, so there is some hope. Um, you, you know, the one thing I can say and kind of looking at it, and I've been dealing with a lot of people about this, is certainly in our country, the United States, you know, entertainment has been one of the industries that's been a true leader. You know, we have the aerospace business, we have education, we have medicine, we have tech and entertainment. And the kind of money that's needed to backstop the insurance is not that much for entertainment. And it would put a lot of people back to work. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. And also, as you know, those of you who are in the entertainment business, and Blair will understand this very well, is the kind of jobs that get created just from uh, the film industry are huge. They rent huge amounts of cars. Car, car rental companies are all going bankrupt. Film companies get back in business, they rent thousands of cars. They buy lumber products. They put people in hotels. They buy food. So I mean, it, it's a it's an industry that not only employs a lot of people but purchases a huge number of services. You know, certainly airlines. Um, you know, that actually will benefit the economy and help things get started again. So you know, there are a lot of people trying to do things, but. Insurance for independent productions is a essential thing because the margins on these films are so low and, and the uh, investors aren't gonna take those risks. Studios, streaming companies will get back to work, but you know it's yeah. gonna cost a lot more money to make movies with all these protocols. Um, that's, that's, another, that's another big concern for the independents. And I work on studio, uh, 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 projects and on independent projects and you know all this everyone's having the conversation about the cost that the COVID precautions will be you know people are throwing uh, around percentages 10% of your budget 20% of your budget whatever it is independents you know you John Sloss you know this if you're selling if you're pre-selling um, a film, you're getting X amount of money. The the people who are you're working with in the sales business aren't going to go. Oh, and we're going to give you another fifteen to twenty percent because of the COVID costs. And the what? COVID costs are everything from testing to PPE to also adding time onto your shooting schedule for the you know the amount of time in any given day that you need to set aside for safety. So that's also. If you put the combination of insurance plus the onerous cost of, of COVID safety protocols onto an independent, I'm, I'm very concerned about how that gets uh, sorted out going forward. Well, the good news about Synetic, Blair, is that we don't sell films for what they cost. We sell films for what they're worth. Um, <laughs> Thank yeah. you for that. Thank you, John. <laughs> also, a little self-promotion. No, um, but we know that about you. Know, we know that about you, and so you okay. know you must say yes to my next movie. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank so, you. Uh, <laughs> I would love to continue along these lines, but I have. But there's a related area that isn't about this level of insurance that you touched on with the waivers, um, 
Blair, which I think needs to be addressed. And that is the issue of immunity from, from uh, liability. Uh, if, if producers follow these protocols, if they use best practices, and heaven forbid somebody gets sick, uh, what can they do to protect themselves from being sued? Uh, you know, I, I was talking about this with Andrew the other day, and I didn't realize this, but it makes perfect sense that that kind of immunity from liability, apart from the waivers that we talked about that, that President Trump's trying to get people to sign for his uh, rallies, uh, this sort of congr or legislative immunity, I guess, is a very um, uh, uh, partisan issue. It comes down it, it, that Republicans um, want this immunity for people to sort of go back into production and know they, they won't get sued if they, if they do their job right and someone still gets sick. And I guess the unions or, or whomever have issues with that. So I get, so I don't know where that all stands because that's different from the kind of insurance issue we're talking about. Yeah, I mean I'll I'll I'll, I'll grab that for a second. You know, the there there is um li immunity from liability is always a very difficult question I think in in Congress and it does take on partisan connotations because the there, there's always a setup, I think, of large corporations seeking immunity from actions of, of any kind or, or, the, or their operations. And on the other hand, you have not just the plaintiff's bar, but those who have been harmed, um, you know, who can often pre pre present a compelling case. And, 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 and the, the trick, trick is maybe the wrong word, but the difficulty is to say, yeah, so a small producer or a producer who's done everything, followed every guideline, adopted best practices, started their production with the idea of not what is my liability, but what is my responsibility to my actors, to my staff, to everyone I want to hire. Yeah, you could see why that person would present, you know, I shouldn't have to bear then the cost of defending myself in court. Although again, most courts would not hold that person liable. At the same time, you have to look at the meat packing plants or, or chicken processing plant or uh, a, a discount um, grocer or somebody who has shortchanged their non-union employees uh, uh, from PPE and provided substandard care and no kinds of compensation, no health care, no sick leave, no paid leave, come to work or you're fired come to work or you're fired, does that company deserve liability protection by government action? Or, or should they have to face at least somebody who might be willing to challenge them, even recognizing that the class that they're representing is not a wealthy class, but, but you only can do it by a class action. Uh, it, it's not clear to me what would have happened to the tobacco, uh, to tobacco companies had we not had the class actions that brought them to heel and the judgments against them, which forced them to come and begin to admit and, to, and, and all of the revelations. And so liability suits are, are a hugely important component also in this country of holding the private sector accountable without the government having to be the only actor that does it. Because I, um, I, I work for someone who impeached the president of the United States. Let me say, if you only could rely on this administration, if you could only rely on this administration to hold someone accountable, we're doomed. All uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, look, at it, it's interesting, um, I guess. But the question is, can you say to a responsible person who follows these best practices and protocols, uh, in all likelihood, people won't get sick, or, or if they do, in all likelihood, you will not be held liable. Because I know that, you know, you're saying that the guilds are telling people not to sign waivers. I think a lot of those waivers aren't even enforceable, even if people sign them. No, uh, they're, they're not. But a lot of this is going to be dependent on testing and the frequency of testing and the um, reliability of the tests, which we're not there yet. We might be, they might be there in Germany, or Iceland or New Zealand, but we're not there yet here. Um, this, this, is, this is a vestige of the conversation we were having before, but I forgot to ask it and I will. 
you guys know the status of these additional costs in terms of state uh, rebates and, and tax schemes. Um, are all these additional costs generally going to be covered by um, the, the, the rebates? Well, they should be. I, I mean, so. it's just the cost like anything else. I think so. I, I think, I, I'm not, I don't know for sure, but I think we've had, I think people have been talking about this and I think there's a general assumption that you know, they are, it's a cost of production. We'll be tagging all of those costs. I think, I think oddly enough, from what I'm hearing, it's more of a conversation than you would think, Steve, that uh, it's not a given. Um, in, in some states it is, in some states it's not. Um, but it's something to keep your eye on, obviously, if you're trying to understand the, you know, the universe of costs in making a film these days. Yeah, but I mean, the majority of the cost from these protocols is going to be the additional time. So yes, there's going to be costs for testing and um, PPE and all that stuff. But the majority of the costs are going to be that schedules will be increased by, you know, 10%, 15%. And those are just costs. I mean, you can't really, um, you know, figure out, you know, well, what are the additional days of shooting because of uh, these protocols? No, certainly not. When you come to, ta to when you come to sort of putting out your, um, you know, submitting for reimburse for your tax credit for those things. But I think you can internally. I think internally you can understand that cost. But I think for you know purposes of the tax credit, you wouldn't. I mean, because it's just a cost like anything else. I mean, it's uh, day additional days of shooting. Well, one thing about liability, which I will mention is, and I don't know what's happening now that people are going back to work, but I think a number of states passed laws that said if someone did get sick and had a job, it presumptively was something that would be the employer's responsibility. So, I mean, the states have passed these laws that make it, from a legal point of view, the, the employer has to prove the employee did not get uh, COVID from the workplace. So but that's such a murky, I, like how you could get COVID anywhere. How, how would anybody be able to say, I got uh, this at work? Well, it's just shifting the burden of, um, right. you know, having to prove how you got it. Yeah, it's a hornet's nest. There's that, there's workman's comp statues, there's the, the enforceability of waivers. It's, I mean, I find it fascinating as a lawyer, but yes, it, it's far from, from clear. Uh, here's a question for you, Steve. Do you see, considering the, uh, the actuarial analysis of this, can you see the idea of full production insurance being offered at higher premiums, taking on without without a government backstop, taking on board, you know, the probability, the risk uh, of people getting sick uh, if they follow, you know, if the protocols are proven to be followed? Right now, there's no insurance for that at all, at any price. Um, that's as of today. Um, as I mentioned, there are insurance companies looking into providing some limited um, coverage for this, and it will be very expensive. Uh, here's, a good, here's a good question for Andrew uh, that came from the audience. Um, is there anything we can do as John and Jane Q. Citizen to uh, help the likelihood uh, of Priya passing? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, absolutely. Number one, as individuals, you have far more influence and power with your member of Congress than you realize. I think we're uh, cultured to think that we can't access or that you have to have tons of money or be a fundraiser. And I will tell you flat out, if you are a constituent of a member of Congress, call them and tell them why and, 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 and say that, that you are concerned about this. Uh, I think the second thing is, is that we have gotten a lot of support. I think we're up to 30 uh, various trade associations that are supporting it. And so through professional organizations that you exist in or that you work in, also make this a priority and, and to make it a priority, people will listen, uh, not just to your individual voice with your individual member, which is very influential, but in the aggregate, uh, the trade associations, the guilds, the unions, everybody who's involved, 
to weigh in. And the entertainment industry, I think, as, you, as you've indicated, uh, has a unique capacity, if you think of it in the most expansive way, not just independent production, but you know, uh, we have you know, uh, the, 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 the major sporting leagues all want this type of insurance because it's a huge benefit to them and their reopening and their liability. And what about stadiums and not just, you know, people who are working for me, but people are going to come in contact with the thing I'm putting on. And at the same time, then that triggers Fox and Fox Sports having a des strong desire to see this through. So, you know, all of these ways to push and to get folks to pay attention to this, to say it's not a partisan issue, it's not a gotcha issue, it's not an industry versus industry issue, but it's a we want the economy to restart issue and I can't begin my job. I can't hire the five people. I can't start production and my five people getting to work and my, my may seem small to you, but the multiplier effect, to use my ancient economic term, the multiplier effect, just as, as you all mentioned, the kinds of derivative jobs that film and entertainment production bring are hugely important and they're important across the nation. It's not just a New York issue by any stretch of the imagination. It's everywhere you would want to film. And it's everybody who's involved in that, from the caterer to the, as, as you said, to the rental car company, to the airlines, to the hotels who are desperate to get restarted, all of that. And entertainment, production, all of this is critical to that. And with what, 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 what does our country look like if we're, um, it's a pretty sad country if all we're doing is watching is is watching is watching reruns and counting on a few very very large uh, enterprises to provide us with um, you know with 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 our streaming uh, fix. I mean that's very well said, and uh, and it, as uh, we said before, I mean one of our proudest exports is is our storytelling, is our, is our you know our film and television on a global level. But is that the way Congress sees the film industry? Do they understand? So again, I'm gonna I'm gonna broaden it out. Congress sees the entertainment industry in the in the broadest possible sense, and they don't think of it necessarily as the film industry. So it doesn't it, for the purposes of what we're trying to achieve right here. Our allies are the NFL as much as they are the documentarians who want to talk about what Colin Kaepernick went through. Or the NFL, or the, you know, or the NFL's horrendous record on concussions. Previously, uh, I want to be careful here. I I offer opinions as myself, not as my boss, I, for whatever that's worth. Although that's not uh, necessarily it. But but my point is, is that we have a, you have a very very broad group of 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 people who fall under this rubric who are interested in the same thing. They all want to get back. They all want to get back and they're all facing the same questions, whether it's a five person production or it's a 5,000 person production. We're all facing these same questions. How do we reopen safely? How do we get the economy restarted in a way? How do we climb back to where we were? I think that those who are predicting this, um, they call it the hockey stick or the V. Oh, we went down and we're gonna just shoot up and everything's gonna be fine and wonderful, are kidding themselves. I truly, truly, we're gonna experience spates and shutdowns and intermittent breaks and supply chain and other things like that, which are gonna bedevil the economy. And we're, we are, for this moment, I think, for this industry, all in it together, the big and the small, and uh, you know, not everybody can self-insure. And that's, I think, why you have very strong allies in the major networks, in those who are dependent on live sports uh, for their major revenue streams for whom that subsidizes a lot of the creative content that they want. So it doesn't just have to be the MPA. It just doesn't have to be a Hollywood issue or a New York issue. If you want the SEC network up and going again, and you want to watch Alabama, Auburn, you should be for Priya too. There so you really go. you're saying that we need to rally everybody we know to call their representatives because that was not on my radar at all. Please. It's something I needed to be actively engaged in. We've been talking to, you know, um, Gillibrand's office. I've talked right. to regularly and of course the governor's office and the mayor's office, but right. I think that's a great, point to sort of go oh wait we are constituents and we can 
start making some noise about trying to get this passed because right. it materially affects our being able to go back to work. That would have been a great way to end this panel, but leave it to me to spoil it. I have a very specific, but very good question. Uh, I think it's for you, Blair. And that is, will these additional costs um, uh, of the COVID protocols be allowed to push films into higher tiers with the guilds? That is an excellent question. Um, I think that uh, I don't. I well, I certainly don't know the answer to that question. But I, I think it's it, and it's great. I hadn't thought about it before. I think it's really important. And the one thing I will say is that, you know, when we get into the kind of super nitty gritty, when we're talking to our uh, union friends who are the business agents, they are all saying we're in this together. We have to figure this out together, and it's going to be different for every production. We'll have a baseline for safety and protocols, but then every production is gonna have very specific and unique uh, challenges that we'll address. So I actually, I, I'm so glad that was asked. I'm gonna ask that uh, the next time I have a conversation with, uh, with the union because that's, I don't know the answer and it's a great question. All right, well, our, sadly our hour is up. Uh, I want to thank our brilliant panelists. Um, Steve, Andrew, Blair, um, you'll be able to watch this for the rest of eternity on the, on the, <laughs> <scenario>. <laughs> that is a terrifying thought. So scary. It's terrifying. No, not fair. Not fair. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and we'll be back in a couple weeks and, uh, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, so, John, John, thank you for, for having me, and I'm sure the rest of us feel this way. I think these roundtables have been so good and interesting, all of them. I, I've watched them all, and thanks for putting them together, because they're, they've been great. And thanks, Amen to uh, that. Thanks, Andrew, John. Thanks for taking the leap, Andrew. Thank I know John. this is one of your... <laughs> <laughs> if I have a job next week, I'll, I'll, I'll be very grateful for being here. <laughs> so, yeah. always, there's always a desk for you at Synetic. Well, uh, <laughs> Steve, I will see you early and often. Excellent. Okay. Pretty much. Bye. You got it. Bye. Bye. Bye.